Jesus is risen. And that makes all of the difference in the world. You get your Bibles out this morning and turn to John chapter 20. If uh, you don't have one, there's one in the rack in front of you there. And we're going to turn to John chapter 20. And to take a look at Jesus' um, first appearance at the tomb. And that's an amazing story, amazing true story. And uh, we want to focus today on what Christ has done and what he's accomplished and, and why the resurrection is so important to us. Uh, two or three weeks ago, Sue and I had the privilege of going to see the movie Risen. Now, I go to movies about once every six years. And, uh, and so we went and saw this one, and uh, I actually recommend movies about once every 12 years, which means this will be the first one I've ever recommended to you to go and see. Um, it's a fiction. It's a story of the perspective of... Um, the resurrection, which is true. The fiction part is that it's through the eyes of a, of a Roman soldier. And uh, pretty accurate, though, uh, pretty significant, and uh, an amazing movie. You should go and see it. But the, the point of all of that is, in the movie Risen, the Roman soldier is confronted with the possibility of the resurrection and the implications of it. And in the movie, he is asked the question. And the question is, what frightens you? And his answer was being wrong and wagering eternity on it. Being wrong and wagering eternity on it. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes all of the difference in the world. And if you get it wrong, you're wagering eternity. You're wagering separation from God. You're wagering, literally wagering hell on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's an important day. It's a significant day. Today is a day where we hoot and we holler and we celebrate because Jesus Christ is alive. And so uh, you got your Bibles open by now, I trust. I want you to stand with me if you would. We want to honor God as we read his word. And I'm going to read from uh, chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and uh, they were going towards, excuse me, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I am not ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then she said that she had said these other things that she had heard. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word and we've read it. We've sung about it. We've worshipped you. We have rejoiced because Jesus Christ is not dead. He is risen just as he said he would. Father, I pray that as we uh, hear from your word today, not the, not the views of man, but what does your word say, God? And I pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear 
minds God to understand, and then God coming out of this service, passionate hearts to live for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who not only came, who not only died, but rose again, God, so that we could have life, we could have it abundantly, we could have it with surety. So lead us in your word today. God, give the one who is here who's never trusted Christ, open their eyes to see the Savior today. And for those of us, what difference will it make? What difference will it make that Jesus Christ is risen? Do your work in your way for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can take your seats. Well, we want to take a look uh, briefly this morning at the text part of this as we consider this through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was um, healed by the Lord Jesus um, probably months and months earlier, but had become a very devout follower of Jesus Christ. She, along with a few other women, along with the 12, were the core group that followed Jesus, and she was certainly a part of that group. When we come to this story, we come to the part about the resurrection and uh, we need to understand some things, that she was there, as uh, she saw it, as uh, she understood. Um, met much of it, there's direct correlation to the Word of God of what she saw and what she heard. We're going to see that. Many believe that uh, because of the rest of it, that she probably was following pretty closely while the trials were going on back and forth and back and forth. And she might have even heard Pilate pronounce the death sentence on Jesus Christ, perhaps. But what we know for sure, because Scripture says it, is that she was there when Jesus came out. After his back had been whipped and opened up, he had suffered the beatings, and he comes out and he's carrying his cross, and he can't carry it, and Simon of Cyrene is given the responsibility to carry it. Scripture tells us she saw that. She, she witnessed it. She was there for it. She witnesses Jesus is led out and up to Calvary, and as he is spat upon she is there when they take Jesus Christ and they nail him to the cross. She watched it. She saw it. She sorrowed and stood at the very foot of the cross and watched her Savior die. She heard the bitter cries that came out from those who were hanging on the cross. She watched as the soldiers broke the legs of the two thieves so they couldn't push up anymore and would die more quickly. She was there when Jesus cried out, it is finished. And she watched Jesus die. She was there when the Roman soldiers, to make sure he was dead, took the spear and between his ribs took it and thrust it in through his lung, through his heart. Jesus Christ was dead and she watched it. She saw it all. And perhaps... She was one of the last people to leave the hill that day, leaving Jesus on the cross. But her story doesn't end there. Because in Joshua, I mean, excuse me, in John chapter 20, verse 1, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Mary was the first one at the tomb. And she goes and she gets there and the stone is rolled away and she looks in and Jesus isn't there. And so she runs and she tells the disciples, they've taken him, he's gone. And, and they go running, John and Peter, the, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved is John. And John and Peter, they go running to the tomb and, and John gets there first and, 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 and Mary's coming up behind them and, and she sees uh, John look in and then she sees Peter push by and go right in and then John comes in and, and they come out. And they head back to their homes and she stays there. She's at the tomb. She tells the disciples. She goes back to the tomb and as we read in the text, she's there and she looks in and has the experience with the two angels, one at his head and one at his feet. And she comes out and she's weeping because they've taken Jesus away. Where is he? And she hears the question from the gardener. Where have you taken him so that I can take him? She'd gone to anoint him. And then Jesus says one word. He says, Mary. And she looks up and she sees Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And the text that we read finishes with, and Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Sue and I had the privilege to be in Israel three years ago. We had the privilege to be at the spot where they believe is the tomb that Jesus Christ rose from. 
Uh, while we were there, we were having communion. And uh, we got these little cups that were there. And uh, we had communion while we were there. And I remember that day so vividly. We were there. And we were focused on communion. We'd been singing some worship songs. And, and as I was having communion, the cup and the little cracker, I looked over and I could see the tomb. And there was nobody in it because it was empty. And I was a mess. Sue's so like, what, what's wrong with you? And just the overwhelming sense of having the cup and the cracker representing his blood and his body and realizing that Jesus Christ is not dead, he is risen. It makes all of the difference in the world. It makes all the difference for every one of us in this room. And Mary was there. Mary was the first person that Jesus was revealed to after his resurrection. But as we said on Good Friday, we say today, but why? But why is this so important? Why is this so critical? Now, there are many proofs about the resurrection. There are many proofs in Scripture. There are proofs outside of Scripture as well. But there are many proofs. Uh, we have Mary in the garden, and we have uh, her coming to the tomb and seeing Jesus. We have Jesus appear to the disciples in the upper room. We have Jesus appearing to the two men on the road to Emmaus. We have Jesus after Thomas had doubted. Remember, he, he appears to Thomas. We have Jesus coming, and he appears to them in Galilee. We have Jesus coming on the beach when he reinstates Peter after Peter's denied him three times and the Lord comes and Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And each time, go and feed my sheep, go and feed my sheep, go and feed my sheep. And so the doubter Thomas, his doubt is taken away. And the one who needed to be restored is restored because Jesus Christ is alive. The book of Corinthians, it says James. James, who was the brother of Jesus Christ, who had rejected him all through his life. After his resurrection, he sees the resurrected Jesus Christ. He becomes a follower of Jesus. And in Corinthians, Paul says there were 500 more people who saw him. 500. Paul's like, hey, if you don't believe, they're still around. There's a bunch of them that are still alive. You go and ask them. You go and ask them if Jesus was risen from the dead. And then Paul's testimony itself is an amazing testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul hated Jesus. Paul hated the followers of Jesus Christ. He was consenting to Christians being put to death. And he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and he is saved. Lots of proof that Jesus Christ was risen. But why? Why? What's the significance of the resurrection? The good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection for us is so critical as we move forward. If Jesus Christ only died, then he wasn't who he said he was. He, wasn't, he didn't do what he said that he would do. And so today, for a few minutes, I want to take a look at five reasons that the resurrection is critical. Five reasons that what you've been cheering about, hooping and hollering about, why we did all of this work, why is that critical? Here's the first one. It was part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan. The concept of a resurrection wasn't new in the New Testament. We're going to see that in a minute. But back in the book of Job, in Job chapter 14, it says, If a man dies, shall he live again? And then in Job 19, 25 and 26, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he will stand. And, and so Job understood there was going to be a resurrection. The resurrection was part of God's plan. It was part of God's salvation plan. In 1 Peter 1.3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
In Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What separates Christianity from every religion on the face of the earth is that the Savior rose from the dead and he is alive. He didn't die and go away. He's alive. He is risen. We had the privilege in this service to watch three baptisms. Three baptisms. Why why did they do that? Well, there's a sense of obedience in that for sure, but there's the reality of identifying with Jesus Christ. Identifying with Jesus Christ in what? In his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that was the picture of three amazing stories of of God's goodness and God's faithfulness and God's grace poured out. It was God's plan. Not only that Jesus would die, but that he would rise from the dead. Another critical reason for the resurrection is it shows his sovereign power. It shows the sovereign power of Jesus Christ. He has the power to defeat death and the grave. If he can't defeat death and the grave, he is not God, but he did. He is God. He is divine. Before his death, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. In John eleven twenty five, 25, it said, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall He live. I love this quote. The resurrection means that the cross was the payment and the empty tomb is the receipt. The proof that though it may have looked like he died on a cross like a common criminal, he actually died as a sinless man out of love and self-sacrifice to bear the guilt of our sin. Jesus' death on the cross was the payment. But the resurrection was the receipt showing that the payment had been perfect in the sight of God the Father. In Romans 1, 4 it says, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. The resurrection is critical. It shows that Jesus Christ was God, risen from the dead, Well, what else? Well, here's another thing that's critical. Without it, without the resurrection, this book is useless. Without the resurrection, this book is a waste of your time because it's filled with lies. It's not true. But the resurrection is true. And Jesus fulfilled the things that were found in it. Uh, when I was the director of conference center, I had a, a man who used to come and speak for me there. His name was uh, Charles Wagner. He's gone to be with the Lord. But uh, he used to talk about the New Testament in the Old Testament. And he used to say, the new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. In other words, what happens we see in the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. You didn't understand it until you have the New Testament. In the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. Now here's an illustration of it as it relates to the resurrection. Because without it, this is a waste of our time. In Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, it says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or Hades or or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures evermore. And David wrote it and they understood it at some level. But the real meaning of that is revealed in the New Testament. It's found in Acts chapter 2, verses 24 to 32. Here's what it says. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, this is back to that text, I saw the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. 
For you have not abandoned my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Then he goes on, he says this. Brothers, I may, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and he was buried and his tomb is with us today. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would not set one of his descendants on his throne, excuse me, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. And he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. It's critical that the resurrection happened because without it, our scriptures fail. But Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen from the dead. Here's the fourth thing. Without it, your faith is futile. Without it, your faith is futile. We're wasting our time. Probably 500 people in the room in this service. You wasted your time coming here today. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, your faith is futile. In 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 17, it says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how come some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. If Christ is not raised from the dead, you are still in your sin and there's nothing you can do about it. There's no hope for us. There's no assurance for us. and There's, no, there's nothing. But he is raised from the dead. We've seen, we've heard the evidences. Go back and listen to last year's message from 1 Corinthians 15. We took the text and we talked about it. And all of the evidences of the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. It's critical because if he's not raised from the dead, your faith, it's futile. It's futile. But Hebrews 7.25 says, Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. My faith in Jesus Christ is not futile. My faith in Jesus Christ is founded because of the work that he did. Hey, you don't get saved by the resurrection. You don't get saved by the resurrection. You get saved by the work on the cross. You don't get saved by what happened on Sunday. You get saved by understanding that Jesus Christ came. He died on a cross. He suffered. He hung there. He bled there. He shed his blood for your sin. And you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you're saved. You don't get saved by the resurrection. What's the resurrection? We already read it. The resurrection is the receipt. It's the proof that Jesus was who he says he was. He did what he said he would do. Without the resurrection... Your faith is futile. And without the resurrection, there's no hope. There's no hope. If Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, we have no hope of eternal life. We have no hope of standing before God and him saying, well done, good and faithful servant, because without the resurrection, the work on the cross was not complete because Jesus wasn't who he said he was. But because of the resurrection, there's great hope. And Jesus sits at the right hand of God making intercession for us. And I have hope. Here's the hope that I'm going to stand before God one day. And he's going to say, Paul, why should I let you into my heaven? And I'm going to say, because of him. Because of Jesus Christ. Because of what he's done. He is my hope. He is my satisfaction. Everything I have is dependent upon what he has done. In Romans 14, 9, it says, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 it says for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so through Jesus God will bring 
to him those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus Christ is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's either who he says he was, he did what he said he did, or he's a liar and he's a lunatic. But we've seen the resurrection. We've seen the proof. The divinity of Jesus rests on the resurrection. The sovereignty of Jesus rests on the resurrection. Our justification being made in a judicial act as if we'd never sinned rests on the resurrection. My regeneration, my hope of eternal life, the change in my life happens as a result of the cross but is proven because of the resurrection. And one day, my final resurrection rests in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, it's Easter. And shortly after the disciples would go out and start to spread the news of what happened with Jesus and his resurrection and, and the story in their life. And it wasn't a hoax. Nobody dies for a hoax. But these men who were faithful, called by God, they lived and they, many of them died for the sake of Jesus Christ. There's a great passage in um, Acts chapter 5. It's the only place I'm going to ask you to turn. So I turn to Acts chapter 5, verses 29 to 39. Here's what it says. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. You've heard that verse before. Lots of people quote it. I got to obey God more than I got to obey man, right? That's usually where we stop. But listen to the rest of it. The God of our Father raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as a leader and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So they're before, they're being challenged, they're before the religious leaders, and they're being called out, and the story goes on. Here's what it says, and when they heard this, they were enraged, and they wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And then he said to the men, Men of Israel, take care about what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, the Judas, the Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and it came to nothing. After him, Judas, the Galilean, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of a man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. If it wasn't true, if it was a hoax... It would have died. And Jesus is gone, just like the other guys. The followers would be scattered, and it would go nowhere. But also in the book of, of, of uh, Acts, it talks about these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Because Jesus Christ is risen. That's the difference. The receipt is in our hand. And here we are 2,000 years later, worshiping the resurrected Savior Jesus Christ, the Lord. Well, so what? So what? What should frighten you? Just as the Roman soldier was asked in the movie, what should frighten you? And the answer is being wrong and wagering eternity on it. Being wrong and wagering eternity on it. See, Jesus Christ, he died for your sin. There's nothing you could do. Sin separated us from God, back from the garden. We understand there was nothing we could do. We couldn't fix it. All the Old Testament, all, all of world religion is trying to, how do we get right with God? How do we get back with God? How do we 
And God sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ. It's through what he did. He came. He was the sacrifice. Your sin separated you from God, and you couldn't fix it, and you didn't earn it, and you couldn't possibly deserve heaven, and therefore God sent his Son to be the right and righteous payment, the satisfaction of God's wrath for us, and he hung on a cross. And he rose again as the receipt that he was who he said he was and he did what he said he would do. And and so what do we do? What do we do to get this? What do we do to receive this gift? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and you will be saved. The wages of sin is death, but the gift from God is eternal life. See, we're all there trying to to earn our way, trying to get our way to God. And God's going, you can't do that. It's a gift. You can't possibly do anything about this. I have made it possible for you through Jesus Christ. All you can do, all you can do to be saved is believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. If you're here today and you've never done that, that offer is available for you. What Christ did for you on Good Friday and proved it was all true on Easter Sunday, that gift is available to you. And you believe and you will receive eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. But what about the rest of us? Many of us in the room, probably most of us in the room, have already made that commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, they leave you never the same. They leave you never the same. When you take the weight of what Christ has done for you and you understand the work of salvation, the gift of God, you must be a changed person. You cannot, you cannot get to, well, yeah, that was kind of cool. No, no, Jesus Christ died and paid a price so that we could live for him and live for his glory. And we get to have Easter. Actually, every Sunday is Easter. But we get to have Easter so that we never forget what Christ has done for us. It leaves us never, ever the same. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I am not the same. Because I have the receipt in my hand, I am not the same. He is risen. And the gift of eternal life is yours. The offer is yours. And hey, church, the responsibility now to live out for the glory of our Savior, it's a responsibility, it's a challenge, and it's an awesome privilege because of all that Jesus Christ has done and accomplished for us on the cross and in the receipt of the resurrection. Let's pray. Father, this is from your word, all of it. We started in John 20, and we talked about the story. We just looked at verse after verse after verse about who you are and what you've done, and your resurrection wasn't a fable. It's not just a story. It's the reality, and our faith is based upon it. It's rooted in it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would... uh, the heart that's here today that's never trusted Christ, that you would open eyes. Open eyes to see the work of Christ and what's been accomplished for us. That they would come in simple faith and trust Jesus Christ the Lord. And then God, I pray for the rest of us in this room. This should shake us to our core because of what Jesus did for us. And so if sin is being revealed in our lives today or disobedience is being revealed in my life today or a sense of I'm not walking as I should and you're laying something out before us, then God, break us because of who you are and what you've done for us in Jesus Christ the Lord. What do you fear? What do you fear if you're being wrong and wagering eternity on it? Father, we don't have to do that because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Do your work in our hearts for your glory, for the fame of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray these things 